Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with Florian Glatz. Florian Glatz is a legal researcher, a lawyer, and also a software developer, one of those rare breeds. Now, uh, I've known Florian for a while, but recently he was giving a talk at our meetup in Berlin about the sort of legal side and complications of smart contracts, blockchains, and uh, DAOs. And I thought it was a fascinating talk. It really opened up some new ways of thinking about these issues that I think are uh, extremely important, but rarely discussed. And I'm really excited that we have him on today to dive into these things. And I think they'll they'll be the kind of issues that will have a a great impact on how this industry and this technology turns out over the coming years. So thanks so much for coming on, Florian. Thank you for inviting me on the show, Brian. Well, it's 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 kind of strange. We were talking about this with Brian uh, before the show. There's um there's really a, a, a wide gap between sort of what the cryptocurrency community considers as you know real legal issues and then what lawyers how lawyers look at it so just in the case of a DAO you know you talk to someone who's building a DAO they're like no we're the DAO we, we, we we're not involved in the project the project lives by itself and the, the you know we're not legally tied to it and then you have lawyers on the other side say well actually no that's not the case courts will look at it quite differently and you'll find out uh, that uh, you are liable and so you know, we can we can go dive deeper in this but uh, just but interesting that, that there's a, quite a chasm between uh, between what the community thinks and, and what you know attorneys or, or uh, law, legal expert might think. Yeah, it's very interesting. I agree, and uh, there certainly are uh, different perspectives on uh, the relationship between the law and uh, this whole new space of cryptocurrencies, which uh, touch upon legal topics quite uh, intensely in many ways, and. Uh, I think there is a lot to learn on both sides uh, by lawyers and by uh, developers in the cryptocurrency space. Uh, They can learn a lot from each other. And uh, I think in the end, it will be a huge benefit for both sides and uh, it will advance, I think, both sides. And hopefully we can see a convergence uh, of those two spaces of which, um, yeah, I hope I can bring some uh, or contribute something to this convergence. One of the interesting things too is that, it, you know, when we got into Bitcoin, already Bitcoin was bringing up all kinds of really interesting, complicated legal issues uh, related to currency, related to money, providing financial services, you know, different liabilities and stuff. And then, uh, you know, when we add smart contracts and, and Ethereum and, and all those things, it just, it gets even way more complicated. And and I think with Bitcoin, you know, maybe we have a reasonable grasp on on a, a fair amount of the issues. I'm sure there are lots of issues even with Bitcoin that are uh, poor, poorly understood. But I think when it comes to you know decentralized applications, DAOs, etc., we we just we have n- almost no idea of how that's going to turn out. I mean, I think some of your work. Uh, helps us understand how it might turn out, but it's it's just something where I mean, because you know, we haven't seen anything yet, right? We haven't seen any legal action, we haven't seen any regulation, nothing at this point. Uh, and from that perspective, I think it's it's going to be an yeah extremely extremely interesting area. Yeah, I agree. I mean, uh, Bitcoin really was. Um, I mean, it started as a. Uh, as a payment system, a new kind of payment system for for the internet and, and the world in general. And uh, the first legal issues that naturally arose were uh, d- surrounded uh, or were around the, the question of uh, uh, financial regulations and uh, what is Bitcoin, what is the legal nature um, of Bitcoins, the currency, is it money, is it a commodity, is it something completely different? And um, uh, I wouldn't say that this is completely settled yet. I actually think that uh, regulation in this regard is still in, in its infancy too. And uh, many, many regulators worldwide are still kind of rather watching it instead of uh, passing regulation immediately. And, uh, but the space, the cryptocurrency space is moving so fast at lightning speed compared to how, how quickly regulators move that uh, 
a completely whole new bunch of issues has already opened up around the question of uh, distributed autonomous organizations. Uh, so some kind of non-financial uh, application of this um, technology and uh, smart contracts, uh, uh, which touch upon uh, our idea of what a contract is uh, from a legal perspective and so on. And um, yeah, there is basically a big, a big game of catching up from the side of regulators, lawyers, and um, I agree that it is uh, kind of difficult at this point to really say how it's all going to pan out in the end. Um, but it's certainly intellectually very stimulating to discuss those topics and um, to kind of fantasize about what could be happening. And it's definitely at the intersection of, uh, yeah, even science fiction, I would say, um, what is happening here. And that's just super exciting. So per personally, I, I find that that things are going quite well. I find it quite encouraging to see that in most places around the world, Bitcoin isn't illegal. Uh, that uh, most regulators have sided on this on the on the side that you know Bitcoin is sh can be used as a currency. Like for example, isn't is it subject to VAT? Um, and like you know, just recently here in France, uh, last week, uh, the the French government. Um, uh, put out this uh, sort of new set of laws governing uh, crowdfunding and crowd lending, in, in which they encourage the use of you know experimentation with the blockchain and um, as a means to secure uh, positions or bonds uh, within a, a crowd lending scheme. So I, I think from from my perspective, I think that things are moving in sort of the good direction. I you know they they're definitely looking at it and taking a sort of wait and see approach. But uh, it is quite encouraging, I think, on that regard. I agree. And I mean, uh, the blockchain is it, essentially it brings um, positive innovation also from the perspective of regulators because it is a perfect audit trail in the end. I mean, um, it allows new ways of auditability of transactions, financial transactions and otherwise. And um, it really is a much better record um, of uh, what happens than any private uh, database organized by um, a single uh, entity um, as it was before. And uh, I think that regulators should welcome this technology um, because in the end it will bring more transparency to a lot of different uh, industries. So in your talk that, that you gave in Berlin, you, you started by kind of positioning blockchains and smart contracts in a larger context of innovation in law and, and technology in law. Can you give a, a bit of background about how you you see those evolutions and how, how that kind of ties or how blockchains and smart contracts tie into it? Sure. So um, what I find very interesting is uh, to think about how innovation can happen in, in, in law in general. And um, if, you, if you look at the history of how, our, uh, of how the law evolved, um, you can see um, that it didn't necessarily need technology to enable um, innovation in law. And uh, one primary example of this that is um, uh, often cited in, in, the, in the context of this new space of cryptocurrency is the uh, so-called Lex Mercatoria or merchant law, which um, is a body of rules um, that developed in all over Europe uh, in the starting in the 13th century and lasting until something like the 17th century. And basically the idea of this was that there um, was a discrepancy between um, uh, the trade that evolved at, at that time, uh, which was already crossing borders. So there were uh, merchants all over Europe that were trading goods with one another and the legal infrastructure that was available to them in order to enforce the contracts and agreements they closed with each other. And uh, the legal infrastructure was lacking. Um, either it didn't exist at all or um, the, the uh, infrastructure was just, um, uh, just underdeveloped. So either there weren't uh, sufficient laws to protect the merchants or there wasn't capable uh, enforcement systems to enforce 
um, uh, contracts. And so what the merchants did is they created their own courts. They created their own enforcement system. And the uh, courts were so-called staple courts. Um, and basically, uh, they were private arbiters are private judges um, that were respected businessmen and they would basically make decisions uh, that were binding among those merchants and um, that was a very successful very efficient system um, it was able to deliver uh, binding decisions for uh, two parties that had some kind of uh, legal dispute with each other within within hours even because in in, in trade sometimes it really is about uh, there's a, a time factor that is very decisive like if you're dealing with goods that um, like like food that can uh, be wasted if you if you have to wait too long and so on so that was a very successful system and it was a kind of innovation in the legal space that was uh, created uh, bottom up and not uh, top down as we normally think about how laws are being made by um, members of parliament or back in the time by monarchs and um, I think this is a very interesting um, history, uh, example in history that compares well to what might be happening right now in the cryptocurrency space. Um, another really interesting uh, uh, way to think about innovation in law um, that is happening uh, today that also is not bound to technology on a, on a primary level is um, the, uh, the idea of uh, creative commons or, and also open source software licenses which is also um, uh, the case where um, a group of people that is um, unsatisfied with how current copyright laws work um, coming together and saying we create our own body of rules using um, the, the, the tools that the legal system gives us, especially contract law, and um, using those tools to create our own rules like the creative commons which is a set of um, licenses that everyone can use and what the creative commons does is basically it liberates um, copyrighted goods in the sense that it says well uh, instead of uh, using the legal default way which uh, is if you create a, a good uh, that is copyright copyrighted by default which means all rights belong to the holder of the copyright, um, it says, well, uh, now this, this copyrighted good can be shared among uh, everybody. You don't need to ask. You just need to respect some kinds of rules, which can vary, but uh, basically it reverts the, 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 the legal order, the legal default. And um, this is also a really inno innovative use of um, of the law in order to create something new, something useful for people, and it's also um, something that was created uh, in a bottom-up process, basically by people seeing a need to change the law as it works by default, and creating something that is more useful. And I think that is a, a really, really nice way to to think about innovation in law, and also to realize that it's possible. It's not. Uh, not, not always necessary to go through uh, the, the procedures of lobbying politicians to pass laws and so on, but actually there is, there is the ability of people to, to, um, to create their own change that they want to see in the world. And uh, I think that's a very encouraging example of how innovation can happen in law. Absolutely, and, and uh, you know, of course, Creative Commons is something that's, that's extremely valuable. And, and uh, I hadn't realized that uh, sort of merchant law had emerged from the bottom up like that. And as you mentioned, perhaps uh, with smart contracts, we may see something similar happen. Maybe in a few years, we'll look back on it as as something that has emerged from sort of the you know, developer community, crypto anarchist community, Bitcoin community, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call it. Um, so coming back to smart contracts, uh, uh, this is a term that gets thrown around. Uh, I, I hear it being thrown around by people in all industries all the time. I'm sure, Brian, uh, you probably uh, 
hear it as well and there's people just throwing around that term and not really necessarily knowing what's behind it. it's just it's like this buzzword um and uh, so let's let's try to define uh, what a start, smart contract is i suppose there are probably uh, multiple definitions but uh, how would you define a smart contract so um standing in between uh, this de software developer identity and the identity of a lawyer my favorite definition is really that of uh, the original one by Nick Sabo, who also uh, who's also a lawyer and a, or a legal scholar and a, and a developer, and uh, he defined smart contracts originally as um, a set of promises that are specified in digital form, and including the protocols within which the parties perform on these promises. So that's a very abstract definition of uh, what a smart contract is um, but it really ties together the um, the software component by referring to digital promises digital form which basically means software code and um, the concept of uh, the legal concept of what a contract is about namely promises party a promising to party B to perform a certain uh, thing in return for something else. And um, I really like this definition. And um, uh, promises, you could say, are uh, the mutual rights and obligations that are uh, the that define the nature of a contract, essentially. And uh, the digital form is it's very abstract but it's machine readable code i would say and um protocols uh, within which the parties perform on these promises is um could be anything and um i think the most popular implementation of this kinds of protocols that we're seeing is was bitcoin in the beginning and now it's uh, ethereum i would say which offers even a bigger variety a bigger choice of, of um, promises that you can formulate and um, uh, there are different definitions of what a smart contract is um, like Ian Grigg who, who invented the Ricardian contract as he called it uh, says that um, smart contracts are just state machines with money so he's really already talking about smart contracts as applications on a blockchain, for example. What's the importance in that definition of, of there being a protocol? I think it's essential because um, what makes a smart contract interesting in the end is that it is enforced in an automated way or that the um, contractual clauses that the parties agree on are automatically executed and without protocols that allow for this kind of automated execution of contractual clauses your smart contract is pretty pointless then it becomes just a convoluted way difficult way to specify something that is more easily specified just in natural language um, it, there, are, there are many ways of how, you, of, of how, can, of how people can close a contract. Um, it can be in written form, it can be in oral form, it can be just by waving your hand uh, in traffic, just signaling someone that um, he can, you know, pass uh, uh, over the street, uh, although you, you may be allowed to pass first by, by, uh, by the law. And... Um, that automatically can create a contract between parties and um, so there really is from the legal side no limitation of how people can close contracts and I think um, using machine code to close a contract is really one of the most let's say abstract and most difficult to comprehend by by the standard uh, of most most people ability uh, a way to close a contract and uh, so I think protocols in that definition are essential because they really bring in this automated enforcement character that is so interesting actually about smart contracts. This makes me think of a discussion that I, 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 I've had a few times with, with 
with bankers around the idea of a smart contract and trying to define, redefine an internal process with um, with a smart contract or with some type, some type of blockchain and the um, the the I guess the the the, the point at which smart contracts stop being interesting in that context is when you have to hand off the smart part of the contract to someone who initiates a payment over SEPA, for example, since we're not, you know, at, at, at this time, we're not using cryptocurrencies, open cryptocurrencies uh, on a wide scale. We're still using SEPA, et cetera, for bank transfers. So um, that that smart contract and automated part ceases to become interesting when at some point in the process you have to stop and someone has to push a button to initiate a payment over a essentially a private payment network exactly i think that um it makes no sense for um uh, if if the contract uh, that is written in in this machine code has to be understood uh, essentially and then executed manually by by a person um that the whole point of it being written in machine code is that a machine can understand it and execute it uh, in a completely autonomous way. Um, there are many issues when you try to um, uh, make people understand this machine code. Um, uh, um, there are many limitations of what you can actually formulate in machine code. Um, of course, like for example, Ethereum is always touted uh, to be uh, so interesting because it is a um, it offers a Turing complete programming language. Um, but uh, Turing completeness isn't really a, a savior when it comes to um, to basically shifting from a legal contract regime to a smart contract regime. Um, uh, one interesting way to think about this is um, also given to us by Nick Sabo, who distinguished between so-called wet code and dry code. And by dry code, Sabo means machine code, machine code, uh, software code uh, that is understood by machines, and wet code, which is um, language that is processed in the brain and of course you can i can write software code that is then written by uh, read by a human and um, that human can try to process that code in their head then but then it becomes wet code again and i think um, it is uh, just on a semantic level um, a very limited way to to express a sentiment or meaning uh, with machine code, I think human language is a much more suitable tool to communicate between humans. So definitely, I think that um, the protocol part of, of this definition, uh, referring to um, protocols that are uh, capable of executing completely autonomously this set of instructions in the smart contract, I think that's really essential to this definition. So smart contract, the word smart contract has in it the word contract. What do you think is, is the relationship between smart contract and legal contract? I mean, at, at least at, at, you know, areas where I work for, you know, for example, Casey, he hates the term smart contract. And there's a lot of people, I think, who think like, oh, it's, you know, it's, it's very problematic uh, because it creates these linkages, which are kind of, it's, a little bit unclear of what exactly the relationship is. How do you think of the, of the relationship between smart contracts and legal contracts? Yeah. So I would agree that uh, language is dangerous in this regard. And um, the word smart contracts come, comes with its difficulties. Um, uh, at first, there is no connection between a smart contract and a legal contract. Um, a smart contract is really just a piece of code that is being executed somewhere. And um, a legal contract is uh, this idea of a binding agreement between uh, parties. And um, the connection between the two really emerges um, through this ecosystem in which smart contracts are being executed, namely blockchains. 
And um, the link, I think, is that a blockchain enables you to create um, binding commitments between multiple parties. And that is pretty much what a contract is all about. Um, uh, essentially, what you can do with uh, uh, a blockchain and the instructions you can put on a blockchain that we came to call smart contracts um, is you can organize economic relationships between parties going so far as to create what we will talk about later, I guess, um, organize, complete organizations. Like you could put the bylaws of um, an organization on the blockchain at least to some part and suddenly you're organizing um, the relationship of dozens, hundreds, maybe thousands of people on a blockchain in a binding way. So blockchains enable you to create um, binding rules between parties and I think that is the link to contracts. So it doesn't really come from 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 the language that we use. It really comes from from the effect of of this environment of a blockchain that uh, allows you to to have uh, binding agreements between multiple parties. And um, but I agree that it's a deceptive name and maybe not the best one. There's even, um, uh, I think, Vitalik uh, Buterin, who, who uh, wrote the white paper for Ethereum um, at some point, said that maybe it wasn't the best choice to call the programs running on Ethereum smart contracts um, because they're not really uh, conforming to the definition that Sabo gave back uh, in the early 90s. But uh, I think the name has stuck and now we have to live with it and um, I I'm fine with it. <laughs> what, what ways are there of combining smart contracts and legal contracts? Is it possible to say like I'm, I'm going to create a smart contract that is a legal contract at the same time or would one have a contract that has you know a legal contract but a smart contract component? What kind of um, ways to go about that are there? So yeah, I think there are uh, many different ways to go about this. Um, in general, um, from a legal perspective, there is really no limit of how two people can enter into contractual relationship with one another. Um, it can happen through a contract that is written on a piece of paper and both parties sign it. It's a very classical way. It can also happen completely orally. So um, uh, a piece of paper is really just a way to document an agreement. The agreement, though, doesn't have to be closed uh, on paper. It can just be a handshake. Um, uh, as to, so that means essentially that you could close a legal contract through a blockchain-based smart contract system without a problem. Of course, um, in practice, there might be problems uh, because blockchains allow people that are completely pseudonymous, not anonymous, but pseudonymous, to interact with one another. So um, I can start to have a binding relationship with someone else of which I don't even the name, at least the address. Um, maybe I know the IP address through some uh, method, but um, that's the only identifier I might have of that person, but probably I have nothing. So it is becomes pointless at this point then to, to think about it as a legal contract because um, there is essentially no identity attached to, to the other party and I can't, even if there was a legal contract, enforce anything. Um, when it comes to the practicality of um, combining those two, um, the very first uh, ideas that have been put out is basically to um, put a to create a, um, a legal contract in the sense that it's a, a written document in in human language, and then to like a digital document, and then to to hash this document, to create a, a hash of this document and put this hash into a smart contract. And basically this creates a link between the smart contract and the 
the document that has been formulated in, in human language. This would be one kind of simple way to create a link between a smart contract and a legal contract. In this case, would uh, would the legal or the you know the written natural language document be uh, you know a, a description of the thing that then that code where it is its hash is put of, of of its functionality and of what it does? Exactly. So the the I think the the devil is really in the detail here. So. Um, there is kind of this obvious way to make the link, but then, okay, you have a link between this legal contract and the smart contract. But what, what does that mean then? Uh, let's say you want to uh, go to court with uh, this, this contract and enforce some claim that the other party didn't fulfill. So the first question the court would ask is, well, what is the content of this agreement? Where is it specified? Is it specified in the legal document, in the, in the human language document, or is it specified in this machine code document that is living on the blockchain? And um, that depends on many factors. And essentially, I mean, first of all, it would be question, the question is what was the will of the parties? Which, which document did they want to make the binding source of their agreement? And it really depends on the circumstances, <laughs> which uh, what, what that would be. Let's say that, um, for example, one of those parties is a business and the other, the other one is a consumer. And um, the, uh, the legal document says, well, um, the parties agree on the rules that are specified in the smart contract. And uh, that's all that's written in this uh, human language part, and the rest is formulated as conditions in uh, in, in machine code. Now, um, I would venture to say that this is not possible because uh, the consumer uh, might not be capable of understanding the machine written code, and the court would say, well, due to consumer protection. Um, this is uh, not a valid way of how to uh, specify uh, the, the contractual uh, obligations of this, of this relationship. And therefore, uh, the court would basically just make up its own rules of, of what the relationship would now be between those parties. So there are, I think, um, lots of pitfalls around creating this link. Now, if you would say that... Um, the human language document contains a description of the code that is being executed in the smart part. The question then is, what happens if you have a bug, for example, in the machine code and something different happens than has been described in this human language part? Um, is, is, uh, is someone liable now? Who's liable for this bug? the creator of this contract or um, is it the other way around that um, there is a bug in the human language part and actually the, the, the machine code part is, is the ultimate source of truth. So this is definitely something that those um, that people trying to do this should consider and they should um, at least make it very clear in the human language part which one of those documents is supposed to be the source of the ultimate source of truth when it comes to what the content of the agreement is. But as I've said before, there might be limitations due to consumer protection laws and so on when you actually try to defer um, uh, to the smart part, saying that ultimately the source of truth is in the smart part. I don't think this is possible under any circumstance, under every circumstance, I mean. Let, let, let's stay a little bit on there because that was one of the things that... Uh, I thought it was very interesting when you were giving your talk uh, at the meetup and it, it made me wonder about the viability of a lot of the things that people are doing uh, in the Ethereum ecosystem and with uh, decentralized applications. So what, what exactly does that mean? I mean, does that mean that if you create uh, decentralized applications, you kind of need to have, a, you know, a, a, first of all, bug-free and complete description of you know all the possible events that then has to be kind of signed off by the user uh, in order to have a kind of a, you know a legally binding uh, agreement there. 
I would say yes. If you have the constellation where you have uh, a business and a consumer closing a contract, then I would venture to say that this, uh, the smart component of this contract, but also the legal component of this contract, is um, uh, falling under the regulations of general terms and conditions, at least uh, in, in the European um, um, territory. And um, in the European territory, that means that um, general term, uh, contracts that are general terms and conditions have to be formulated in the language of the consumer. And um, so like the, 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 the formal language in, in the country that the consumer resides. And uh, like in my case, it would be German or in, in the UK case, it would be English. And it would definitely not be machine code. Machine code is um, <clears throat> not, a lang not an official language in any jurisdiction that I know. And um, that, would, that would basically force the developers of a, or, or, the, or someone who uses uh, decentralized applications and wants to close contracts with consumers to consider this and basically to offer a description of whatever the code does in, uh, in a natural language form in order to make this a legally binding agreement. Now, uh, what so many people cherish about this whole idea of smart contracts is that you don't need the legal component, that you don't need uh, to interface with the legal system in order to, uh, to create binding uh, contracts, in a sense, smart contracts with other people. But um, as soon as you're getting into the area of running a real business, of having your identity, like your, your real identity attached to, to your decentralized application, uh, I think it's unavoidable to think about the fact that you are probably closing legal relationships with the people, um, with the customers of your business, although they might be solely interfering with you um, uh, through a blockchain-based system. Today's magic word is contract, C-O-N-T-R-A-C-T. -T. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener award. Presumably, most people developing decentralized applications will, you know, will not do this, uh, or they may, you know, do it in some ways, but you know, uh, the descriptions won't be complete. They will miss certain edge cases, or you know. Uh, what are the implications of that? I mean, let's now say it is developed by some developers that are, you know, one can find through their GitHub username, or maybe there's even a company that's hiring those developers that's developing that. Uh, what would happen uh, if you have then people using those those applications uh, and they thus aren't, um, well, I guess the they don't conform to the terms and condition regulations there. Well, that would mean that um, certain clauses, certain actions that the smart contract takes are not a consequence that the customer would have to accept. Um, let's say that some, uh, some, some, some event triggers an action by a smart contract and that clause in that smart contract is something that by, uh, by, by the rules of the, uh, by the regulation of general terms and conditions is something that is not allowed. Like there are lots of limitations in, in the terms, in the, um, uh, terms and conditions regulation uh, that, that forbid things like, for example, clauses that are surprising for the consumer. Like, let's say you close a consumer contract and it says that, uh, you know, in small print at the bottom of the last page, it says that um, yeah, like, like you, you, you're buying a car and uh, in, in that contract on the, on the last page in small print, it says, well, you're also selling your house, like uh, you're giving your house for free to, to, to the merchant of the car, right? I mean, that's a completely surprising clause that is not valid in this contract because the consumer totally didn't expect to also sell give away his house when he bought this car, right? Um, that's a very extreme example now. 
obviously, but um, it could be that certain things that the smart contract then does um, lead to a state that the consumer doesn't have to accept. Now, if the consumer then goes ahead and takes this whole thing to court and says, well, this thing happened and um, I don't think this is, uh, this is legal, I don't think I have to, I don't know, pay this fine, um, pay this kind of deposit that I deposited within the smart contract relationship, then a court could rule that indeed uh, this is a, a clause that is invalid Con, uh, according to general terms and condition regulation, and then the the um, the person running this uh, decentralized application would have to transfer back, or would have to pay damages uh, to that consumer. So that would be one possible consequence. Uh, I'd like to perhaps give a my idea of how this uh, this. Could potentially be solved, or how we could remedy this problem. It's something that I've thought about before, and, and like to get your opinion. And I'm, I'm sure there's lots of holes in it, but the way I see it is, I think code should be the one true source uh, of validity of a contract because it's, I think, objectively what is the least likely to um, to have, um, say, contradicting claims in it. I mean, I'm not a legal expert by any means. Uh, I have a very limited knowledge of you know law and things like that. But I think that if it's if it's machine readable, it's it's objectively true, I guess. And so one could imagine some sort of an open standard or protocol, or there could be multiple standards. You know, there could be standards for uh, merchant law, for consumer law, for like business law, that sort of thing. And when you write a contract in code, you define sort of like when you're writing an HTML document, you say, okay, this is an HTML document. It, 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 it adheres to this standard and we can agree that this is the standard format. And it can be parsed. And so that it can be parsed to check that it's it it um, adheres to that standard and that there aren't any sort of contradicting clauses. So for example, in you know, if you had sort of merchant law, uh, you could have a standard that defines sort of all the types of clauses and cases um, uh, and like types of parties that you can have in, in a merchant contract. And with this, then you can, if you can parse it, <clears throat> uh, you can generate you could have libraries, for example, that generate the equivalent in natural language in all types of languages. Um, but so that the the contract that's written in code is always the sort of one true source um, of uh, consensus around whatever the agreement is. And then through this process of defining a standard and parsing the contract and ensuring that the contract adheres to the standard, that has been sort of defined maybe by a consortium or a community, or you know, if you take the equivalent with the web, W3C for HTML or whatever. Um, you could potentially you know, think of a system where you have all, all your whole, all, all, all your bases covered from the legal, the, the, the code to this natural language contract that can be passed on to a consumer or read by someone who doesn't read natural or machine code. Yeah, there are several uh, aspects to this. So um, I definitely agree that um, uh, writing a contract in such a way, basically, that you, I mean, you, you describe several things right now. You, you describe the idea of um, uh, code being more objective, which I think is very disputable. And um, you also describe the idea of using a um, kind of, Markup language like XML or HTML to yeah, yeah, then like uh, to to create this kind of um, structured document, which then ties into a template database that kind of fills this um, XML document. Let's say this XML document with um, um, quotes from this template database, creating this kind of natural language contract. Now, it definitely leads to a more uh, rational, more um, bug-free way uh, of creating a contract if you go about it like this. Um, basically, if you use a system in the way you described, you definitely exclude certain kinds of errors 
compared to when you draft a contract the way lawyers do it today, basically by opening Microsoft Word and just writing stuff out of their head into this document, printing it out, reading it again, correcting some mistakes, and then letting people sign this. There are often there are stupid mistakes in this kind of approach that you would exclude uh, if you use this intelligent templating system and so on. Definitely, I think that is something that will happen in the legal practice anyways, um, uh, because contract templates and uh, templating systems and so on are just a much, much more rational and quicker way to draft documents that adhere to some common standard. Um, uh, the other thing that you said that code is in a sense more objective I think I, I, I wouldn't agree um, I think that um, machine code is too limited really to um, to express all the kinds of relationships that people have today and will in the future I think we will need human language to, um, to, to, to continue living the lives and to have this economic system the way we do it today and will hopefully in the future. Um, uh, moreover, I think that there are certain advantages to human language uh, compared to code, which is that um, the ambiguity especially is helpful in many cases, that as much as it might be detrimental in others. Um, but ambiguity is also a feature. It's not just um, a bug of human language. Um, for example, uh, an example that I really like is um, in the German constitution. We have uh, some really fundamental laws about um, what uh, kind of protections people enjoy vis-a-vis -vis the state. And uh, uh, it was uh, drafted in, in the 1950s, so a really long time ago. And in the 80s, um, the German Constitutional Court interpreted that um, uh, according to Article 2, every German, um, or actually everyone in Germany, enjoys protection from the state regarding obsessive collection of data about them. So basically, they, they, the, the, the Constitutional Court, 30, more than 30 years after the, this Constitution came into force, said, well, um, uh, they created a completely new right regarding electronic data gathering and so on um, from something that was much, much older. And um, this is a really, really important fundamental right today even, uh, much more than in the 80s. Um, because of all this new technology that we have. And that only is possible because language is flexible and ambiguous. Um, now, this is also a bad thing, as we just saw in the case uh, of Apple against the FBI or something, where the FBI uses this um, All Writs Act or something, which is, I think, from 18, 1800s. And they use it to break, to force Apple to reveal their encryption keys. And you're really wondering how it's possible how a law from the 1800s can force a technology company today to reveal encryption keys? I, I don't think that that's correct. I think that what the FBI wanted was for Apple to not not to release the encryption keys, but for them to sure. help them unlock the phone by writing by writing specific software that sure. would allow them to plug into it and, and generate um, and, and iterate through the, the code. You're right. Uh, You're right. It's it's more more refined than as I put it now. Um, what I really wanted to get at is that um, human language uh, in the way that it's ambiguous is um, also a helpful tool um, because it allows judges and lawyers to basically adapt a, an abstract rule which uh, what a contract is to a specific situation and this is something that machine code can't machine code is really very it's binary it's one or zero and it can't really adapt to the multiplicity of circumstances that can occur in the real world but i would agree with you that there are many ways how um uh, uh, software technology can help us to be more rational about the way we currently draft contracts, for sure. 
So we talked already a little bit about uh, you know what happens when decentralized applications interact with consumers and and of course the kind of end end uh, vision there is yeah the decentralized autonomous organization. Now one of the projects that's getting a lot of attention is a project called Slocket. So I thought it would be interesting if you can kind of just look at their example and and what that looks like from a from a legal perspective. I, I'm sure some of us, some of the listeners, will not be familiar with what Slocket is and does. So perhaps it would be good to have a you know a very brief introduction of of how it works, and and then we can talk about the kind of you know legal aspects here. Um, so the way I I understand it is that Slocket offers. Um, uh, a platform to uh, uh, basically tie the blockchain to the Internet of Things. And uh, the first application is a smart lock. So um, a lock that you can put on a door or a car or any other, any other thing. And this lock can be unlocked and locked uh, through transactions on the Ethereum blockchain. And basically, there is the concept of an owner of this lock, so he's like the he's like the administrator of this lock, and um, he can rent out, for example, access to this lock to other people. And um, that's basically what the, that that's the idea what Slocket wants to build. Now, Slocket has this really interesting way of going about this. They are not just this uh, normal company that goes ahead and produces this stuff. But basically, they are creating what they call a DAO, a Distributed Autonomous Organization, which is basically a smart contract or a set of smart contracts running on the Ethereum blockchain, where um, basically um, they are running a crowdfunding campaign to... They let basically anyone who wants to, who believes that this is a clever idea to create such a smart lock, uh, let anyone pay money into the, or ether in that case into this um, D, smart contract DAO. By that, those people become a shareholder of this DAO, a co-owner, and um, then this DAO would spend those funds that were crowdfunded to um, create this smart lock actually in the real world. Now, obviously a smart contract, although it's partially an autonomous entity in some sense, cannot, I don't know, run factories on its own and uh, pay people on its own. So it needs a real world entity to become actionable. And the way that Slocket goes about it is that they create a legal entity. Actually, they created it already. It's a UG. It's a, it's a German, basically the equivalent of, uh, of a limited in Germany. And um, uh, this limited is, they call it the service provider. So it's the, the, the component that makes this DAO actionable in the real world. And um, the, the Achilles heel so to speak, of this whole um, idea is basically then the relationship of this service provider to this DAO. And the way that Slocket envisions it, at least, is that um, the DAO votes on who the service provider should be to create this lock, to manufacture it, to basically uh, arg- make the designs and hire people to, to build it, pay pay probably factories in China, or I don't know where they're going to produce it. And um, uh, the question then really is, how can the DAO control what the service provider does? How, uh, uh, what is this relationship between this entity on the blockchain and um, with potentially thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of individuals being invested in this, having voting rights, according to their proportional to their investment how is this entity going to control what this service provider does and um, I think it's a great experiment that they're doing uh, they they do believe that this is the future of, of organizations and um, I think it's great that they are trying it because it really is an open question if it works how it works and what the pitfalls turn out to be I think no one really knows at this point point. Um, I think what um, 
the one of the key elements of how this of how the DAO wants to exert control over the service provider is basically by um, paying them in milestones. So, so as a first step, the, the DAO would vote on who the service provider is. It would probably be the Slogit UG, um, this legal entity. And then uh, this legal entity has to deliver results. And it will be paid in like milestones and um, if the if the service provider fails or just doesn't deliver or whatsoever uh, the dao will cease payment um to to the service provider that's the basic model i think it's it, it's sort of like uh it's sort of like the 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 service provider is providing some sort of proof of work right they like they have to present uh proof that they've done something to be like produce the lock or whatever and then the DAO pays them a reward I don't know man just think about this the DAO pays them a reward for having produced this work yeah they pay them a reward or they pay them actually in advance in order to enable them to actually order all the goods and and, and, uh, do all this I mean there is a certain risk uh, on the side of the DAO that the service provider runs away with the money, but they reduce this risk by basically splitting the payments into milestones. But so from, from one, I guess the, a few things here. So first of all, is it possible, you know, like let's say on the German law for this company to, to have this relationship with this non-legal entity and to, you know, get essentially all their revenues from from some entity that is not a you know legal incorporated entity so this is that's one question and, and then the other question i have here is now let's say they they pre-pray for you know this tranche slock it goes develops these locks or whatever you know presumably and and let's say they they do an okay job at it but maybe some people are happy with it some people are unhappy with it and is there some kind of recourse for some of the people who put in money there that they say, well, uh, you know, they they didn't do as I expected, and can I now go and and try to get you know s- sue them? So the 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 way that I think Slocket imagines this relationship to happen between the DAO and the service provider is solely through alignment of incentives, not through contract. So there are like two two ways to regulate this relationship between the service provider and the DAO. And um, one is through incentives and the other one is through actual contracts. And um, the way I understood it is that they want to do it solely through incentives, not through contracts. So that means that the DAO is really this organization that lives solely on the blockchain that has a certain amount of money and they have a governance structure embedded in a smart contract and this government governance structure basically says uh, they act upon majority decisions in a sense so the stakeholders um, the shareholders they will vote and if a certain quorum um, gets uh, gets met then um, some action will be triggered or not. Basically, payments are being are going to be paid to the service provider or not. And I think that is the whole relationship that those two entities will have. And I think it is the easiest way to organize this. Now, people are already thinking much further ahead, trying to create a, a closer link between a potential DAO and a legal entity which would basically say that you create a legal entity and in its bylaws you say, well, um, this corporation is being, um, all decisions regarding to regarding this corporation are being um, performed on this blockchain smart contract and whatever is being decided there is going to be executed um, in this legal entity. Now, this is a completely different way to go about this, and it contains much more problematic areas from a legal point of view than what Slocket is trying. Now, the disadvantage of what Slocket is, the Slocket model, is that um, 
uh, for example, the uh, the Slocket UG, the service provider, will create certain intellectual property, for example. They will create branding stuff, logos, whatsoever. They will create um, maybe patents regarding how the slot works. They will uh, create trademarks. They will create uh, copyrightable stuff. So this is all intellectual property that has to belong to some legal entity. Um, it cannot belong to a... Um, a DAO. A DAO is nothing recognized by the law, so they cannot hold any IP. So in the case of Slocket, the question becomes, well, if, if the DAO at some point in the future becomes dissatisfied with the work of the specific service provider, what is going to happen to this intellectual property? Officially, legally, it is still owned by the service provider, and there is no way for the DAO to force the service provider to transfer this IP to, I don't know, the next service provider that they elect. Now, if you think about, rec if you think, if you think about um, incentive alignment as a regulation mechanism, again, for this relationship, you could say, well, then maybe the service provider has to put this huge deposit into the smart contract and if they don't give back the IP then the 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 um, the DAO will get this deposit like the security deposit that's that's mechanism design but I mean how big will this deposit be right you can't really you don't know how successful will this lock it lock be will the IP be worth millions billions or will it be worth nothing and um, so uh, there have been people on the internet <laughs> suggesting that um, uh, the, the, uh, the DAO should have a proper legal entity as a real world equivalent and uh, this then can hold the IP and so on. This is not the service provider model of Slocket. This is really a different model. This is really saying that, okay, a DAO has basically kind of this uh, legal real world entity that is still the DAO and that's not the Slocket model. And in, in this other model with um, having a real world kind of identity uh, as a DAO, then maybe this, this legal entity can hold IP and so on. But I think it's, it's not clear if this is possible from a legal perspective. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I'm extremely curious how this turns out uh, somewhat tied to this there was a there's been an interesting article by, by S Stephen Paley who was writing about the idea of of being able to sue a DAO in particular that you know if you have a DAO which is this sort of you know non-legal entity there that well courts are not going to say this is just some you know non-legal entity nobody's responsible they're going to say well this is this is an entity that has a you know legal character and in particular i mean he was talking about the american context that this would be considered you know kind of a general partnership and then sort of everybody would be uh liable and and potentially uh you know the courts would take somebody or potentially anybody uh, that's kind of involved in this to um hold accountable maybe take damages from do you, do you share that assessment? I certainly wouldn't exclude the possibility that um, uh, someone that is part or interface interacting with such a DAO would be dissatisfied with something and then try to sue people that he knows are part, he or she knows are part of that DAO. That's certainly something that could happen because um, although in general in the blockchain world, at least today, uh, there is still this idea of almost anonymity or pseudonymity. Um, it is very easy um, to, to, in some cases, to get the identity behind some, some, some person interacting on this, with this blockchain identity. And um, then it's totally possible to, to go to court and claim things. If this is going to happen really depends on what this DAO does. Like for example, if you have, um, like I think Stephen Paley talked about an insurance DAO as an example, and that definitely is a very uh, 
dangerous game to play, I would say, because an insurance DAO is something, it's unlike the Slocket example. A, a DAO insurance uh, basically just works with the assets on the blockchain, monetary assets, and basically creating insurance pools, um, uh, for example, with Ether or some other token that is worth something. And um, uh, then if, if one person has an insurance claim, then there is a subgroup of, of, of this insurance DAO that assesses this claim and um, they can decide whatever and maybe they make a totally wrong decision. And then if it's about a lot of money, I'm sure that the person that feels betrayed will go to some court and claim the money if it's about a substantial sum. In the case of Slocket, I think it's different because there really is a very simplistic relationship between this DAO and the service provider. Um, I don't see why they're, because they have this idea of the DAO paying the service provider in like milestones, there's this very clear, I mean, if the milestones are kind of small enough, not too big, I think it is kind of a relationship that, that would work, that where I think there is a low risk that someone would go ahead and sue this DAO. Um, but in the case of an insurance, that's completely different. There it's, insurances are classically about a lot. Of, I mean, you need a lot of money, gather, concentrate a lot of money in an insurance in order to make it work in the first place. And um, there I could very much imagine that someone tries to sue a DAO. And uh, that's just one aspect of it. I mean, another aspect is that you can't run an insurance business without being regulated in the first place. Insurance is um, a business that is under the supervision of, of, of financial authorities. And um, uh, you can't really run such a business anonymously. So even if no one sues that insurance DAO, um, public authorities would anyways try to find out who is running this insurance DAO and try to identify the people behind it because they are running an illegal scheme if they are not uh, you know regulated so I mean that is if, if there is substantial money in such an insurance DAO for example it would definitely be on the watch list of regulators and they would just from out of their own interest investigate this scheme and try to identify the people behind it you wouldn't really need a, uh, a, a member of this DAO being, you know, agitated and, and feeling like suing someone in there. Cool, super interesting. So, so we're, we're, at the, we're up with, with our time, but so there were, there was a few other topics that we wanted to get to and we didn't manage to. But that being said, I think this is, uh, there's a lot more to talk about here. And I think there's going to be, I'm sure, a lot of new issues that are going to come up over the coming months and years so you know hopefully we, we can do a, a follow-up at some point because i think this would be very interesting to follow these developments very closely yeah i would love okay. to thanks so much for coming on it was yeah super interesting and i think very important discussion thank you brian yeah so with that we're at the end of our shows thanks to the listener as well for listening uh, so we're part of the let's talk bitcoin network you can find our show and lots of other uh, podcasts about blockchain bitcoin and related topics on let's talk uh, you can of course subscribe to our episode on any podcast app on stitcher and you can also get the watch the videos on youtube that's uh, on youtube.com slash episode of bitcoin and if you'd like to, you can leave us an iTunes review or a review on Stitcher or some other platform and send us an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com and then we can send you one of these t-shirts and uh, we would really appreciate that. So thanks so much and we look forward to being back next week.